good. Uh, here at Sarah Bible Center, we have a mission. We have an agenda. Uh, how many of you have ever been into an environment where they say, I want to go where there's no agenda. I'm not into agenda. You know, I've been a part of things where there wasn't an agenda. And guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah, I've been, to, I've been to meetings where there was no agenda and nothing actually happened. You know, it, it's one of those things where you're like, when's something going to happen? Well, we don't know, you know. And uh, some people think that that's really like Christ-like. But the thing is that Christ had an agenda. It was called his father's business. How many know that Jesus didn't just wait around like, what are we going to do today, Jesus? Oh, I don't know. I don't have an agenda. No, he had a stinking agenda. His agenda was to seek and save those who were lost. In fact, people who thought they were found kind of got on Jesus' nerves. Did you know that? Yep. So at Sarah Vital Center, we've got an agenda. Okay, we've got a mission. Going to make the camera guy work real hard today. Bless you, buddy. You're awesome. And uh, our agenda here is to awaken people to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. That, that's why we're here. In fact, we're, we're doing really cool children's ministry right now. And why do you guys do children's ministry? Not to babysit. We don't believe in babysitting, okay? You know, <laughs> but to see children awakened to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. Yeah. We do, we do home groups here. Why do you guys do home groups? To see people awakened to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. In fact, I got a verse for it. You do? Yep, we're at. It's in Colossians. Colossians 1, 28 verses 29. What does it say? I'll read it to you. In fact, um, I'll have you read it with me. Just to clarify right now, Christ is our message. What does that mean? That means that whenever you come to Sarah Bible Center, you should always hear a lot of stuff about Jesus. If you ever hear more about Darren than you hear about Jesus, <laughs> send me an email. All right, declare with me right now. Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts, to bring every person. Now, beloved, in the Greek, that word every is, it means every. This is what Paul says. We preach that every person would come into the full understanding of truth. Okay? He says, it has become my inspiration and passion and ministry to labor with tireless intensity. What does that mean? It means I am committed to enter into the kingdom grind. We are going to crush it. I, I have decided that laziness is just not an option for me. With, just declare, tireless intensity. That's an intensity that doesn't get tired. How many of you want that? Woo! Yep, 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 yep. What's the key to it? The key is what he says next. He says, with his power. Say, with his power. What's the key to tireless intensity? That's a great question. You guys are asking such great questions today. I'm so proud of you. The key to tireless intensity is the power of God. How, how are your power levels this morning? Okay. And where's the power? Flowing through me. That means that the power is not somewhere out there in heaven trying to get it into me. This is what Paul says. I labor with tireless intensity. Why? Because the power of the kingdom and the age to come is flowing in me. I am the conductor. Why? Because he is in me. Oh, shabadaba. Kiriyandadadabamba. Yeah? Yeah? Power flowing through me. Okay. To present to every believer, say every, every believer... That the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. Isn't this amazing? This is what Paul says. Christ is our message. We preach that every heart would step into the full understanding of truth. Yeah? And that through the power flowing through me, every believer would have a revelation of their righteousness in Christ Jesus. That's what we're about. This is our anchor text. This was written not to the Colossians. That was wrong. It was written... To Seattle Revival Center. This is the book of Seattle Revival. Hey, Seattle Revival Center. We preach to awaken hearts. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Slumber, lethargy, apathy is not an option if you're a part of SRC. 
Why? Because lethargic people make people lethargic. But awakened people awaken people. Frustrated people will frustrate people. How many of you have ever been to a church meeting? Hopefully it wasn't here. And the speaker was so frustrated. And then you left feeling frustrated. <laughs> and then we call that gospel frustration. No, gospel means good news. <laughs> good news of great joy. That's available for awakened people, awakened people. And for this reason, it's so important that as ministers, you don't preach your peeves. You say, why are you pointing at me? Because we believe in the priesthood of believers, and that means that you is a minister. As ministers, we don't preach our peeves. What do we do? We preach the Christ. The one who has awakened our hearts and the one who continues day after day, moment by hour, uh, hour by hour, moment by moment, opportunity by opportunity. The God who shows up and even when we don't feel it, even when we don't feel like the coolest things that I see God do are in the moments that I don't feel it. Sometimes the church is too feely, especially the charismatic church. We're too feely. Oh, I should pray for that guy, but I'm not going to. Why? Because I don't feel it. Listen, I'm telling you, when you don't feel it, that is when God's going to show up. Why? Because you're going to be relying on him and not on your charisma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. This is pretty cool. Um, we were at, we, I went to um, uh, Ukraine and, and, and Romania. I'll tell you guys about that here in a second. Um, and then came back and I immediately went to a, a conference in Portland. I said, whoa, you went to Portland? Yeah, that sounds more difficult than Ukraine. I know. So um, <laughs> you should have told us we would have been praying. I, I know, I know, I know. So we went, to, we went to Portland, and I did my sessions, okay? Like, I paced myself. I got my naps in. Like, they told me when my sessions were. I was responsible. I showed up on time. I had my family. We had such a great time. It was good. I was done. And then we are good ministers. We are good guest ministers. So we went to other people's sessions, which is always really nice of a guest minister, okay? Come on, let's go. So anyways, my family and I, we went to the very last session. And I'll be honest, but like, like for my sessions, I was awake, alert, sharp, booyah, okay? But I didn't need to be for the last session. And the reason why I didn't need to be is because I wasn't ministering. So um, I, I, I showered and shaved and showed up, okay? But that was all I needed to do. Until all of a sudden, the lady that was supposed to be ministering said, uh, Darren, come on up. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I came on up. Cool. And, 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 she's, and she, this is what she says. She goes, <laughs> she says, I feel like we're supposed to go after miracles. Go ahead and just give some words of knowledge. Boom. So I grabbed the mic and I brought it up to my face. I did not have any words of knowledge. I had no word of knowledge. Yes, I could have heard from God, but I didn't even really want to ask. Him. Even just asking him for a word of knowledge seemed like more work than what I was even willing to do. So what I do? I made something up. And what I did is I said the first thing that my kids, my kids get words of knowledge. The coolest miracles that I've ever seen always come from my kids. But I will say this. My kids, without fail, whenever we ask for words of knowledge, they always, one of the kids always says the same thing. Bones. Now, coming from a kid, that doesn't sound weird. But coming from a 24-year-old man, <laughs> ish, plus or minus, it sounds kind of fun. So anyways, no joke, you guys. They hand me the mic, and I go, yeah, bones. <laughs> Ask Andrea. This is, this is the truth. And, uh, and they're all looking at me with the weirdest look on their face. And I'm like, whoa, we all got them. Right, I didn't say that. I didn't say it. But I'm looking at them like, I'm not the problem here. I just say what I hear, and when I don't hear, I just say. So I said, Bones. And then Andrea, thank God for my beautiful, amazing wife and bride and 
It's tough. She, she says, fibromyalgia, uh, 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 scoliosis. She starts calling out actual words that have to do with bones. <laughs> so people start coming up, okay? Well, I didn't feel, I still, I didn't feel nothing. Okay, Andrew comes over to help me. And we start praying for people. Guys, we aren't even trying. We just start praying. And, and, and the power of God just starts hitting people. And people start going through deliverance. <laughs> this is, this is so funny. I'm praying for this gal. I, this is true, right, Andrew? I got my head in my hand. Because I'm, I'm jet lagged, Okay. I got my, my, my head in my hand. I'm going, come out, come out, come out right now, right now, 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 come out. And they were, it, they, they were coming out. Like, I, I, I wasn't even trying. Like, literally, guys, it's not by our might nor by our power. It's by his spirit. This, this lovely young lady, you know, severe scoliosis, all, all problems for a long time. We just heard from her pastor this last week. She's completely healed. <laughs> completely healed of, of scoliosis. And, and her, her husband thinks it's awesome. She thinks it's, she thinks it's awesome. The point is, we preach to awakened hearts. You don't have to feel it. It's his spirit that is within you. It's the power of his spirit that is within you. And that's why we are here as a church, as a people, as a priesthood of believers, is to partner together to encourage each other that it is time for us to arise and shine and see Christ Jesus glorified in and through us as a community. We are a family. Yes, and God has called us for such a time as this. So get up off your duff. It's time to get a little rough. It's time to stretch out your hand. We're going to heal the land. We're going to take a stand. All right, you, you, get, you get the idea, okay? And yes, I could do that for days. <laughs> hey, this is kind of cool too. We heard uh, we were having a staff meeting, uh, and we were together. We were doing something. I don't, we were all our, our team was together, and I got a text message. Um, uh, and apparently, your pastor is going to be on Sid Roth June 9th. It's supernatural. Yeah, come on. Yeah, it's not going to be live. Uh, they're going to film it. We're going to film it June 9th, and we're going to be talking about carving realms and, and talking about some of my book and, and portals. It's going to be fun. I want to do the whole unicorns and portals thing. I don't think he wants to talk about unicorns, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah? And if you are a visitor, I don't apologize. This is our, this is our seeker unfriendly service, right? So I'm just kidding. Okay, um, here we go. So what happened? <laughs> what, what happened? Okay, uh, with Ukraine and Romania. Uh, yeah, so we'll just do that here. Um, so during the declaration conference, um, things are starting to really pop off there in, 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 in Ukraine. And we were following the, the news stories um, of the massive long lines of people that are trying to flee Ukraine on foot. And the problem is that the temperatures had dropped to such severe temperatures that people were actually passing out in the snow, frostbite, dehydration. Uh, it, was really, it was really serious. And uh, a minister that we know from Seattle went there immediately and began serving we called him, talked to him while he was in Ukraine, asked him if there's anything that he needed. Now, at that time, they had a driver with a car. They were using that car to get food and medical supplies into Ukraine. And then using that car to get people out. He said, we need a van. And I told the people that are selling this van that we want that I'm going to buy it tomorrow. Um, but I only have half the money. And I said, how much more money do you need? He said, $9,000. I said, count us in, go, go tomorrow, buy the, buy the van, and we'll, we'll, we'll come up with the funds. And you guys did. And you gave, and we bought that van. 
It was amazing. They got this big van so that they could get medical supplies and food into, into Ukraine and then pick up entire families and drive them back into Romania. Now, when I saw that, there's something kind of leapt up in my heart where I really wanted to go. And I said to Charlie Champ, we were in the green room. Um, we ate about 20 pounds of chicken wings at night. It was about 11.30. I said to Charlie, I said, bro, and he looked up at me. I was like, I, I feel like I'm supposed to go to Ukraine. Uh, do you want to go? And he goes, yeah, bro, we need to go. <laughs> Anyways, the next day he said to me, hey, man, uh, were you serious about that? And I was like, no, that was the wings talking. <laughs> no, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm serious. He's like, no, he's like, no, I, I really feel like we need to go. So 10 days later, we were on an airplane, right, going to Romania where we could drive into Ukraine. So that's kind of the backstory. Now, I just want to say thank you because, man, we had five intercessory teams praying for us, and we actually had intercessors praying for us 24-7. So the entire time that we were there, we had a prayer shield going for us. So that is awesome, and there is nothing like a Seattle Revival Center intercessor. Our team is awesome. And they were getting these updates. They, they were getting updates, and they, they weren't from me. Like, we were in Ukraine, and literally, I'm getting updates to pray for us. And I was like, I didn't even know we were in trouble. And I said, who's leaking the information to the intercessors? Anyways, um, no, it was awesome. It was so awesome. And we're, uh, we just had all this prayer. And so, day one, we went and had these tours of these refugee centers. Now, the three refugee centers we went to, one was a community center, one was a drug rehab center, and one was like a missions outpost center, like a YWAM. As soon as the war began in Ukraine, these guys did a massive pivot, and they all became refugee centers. This meant that when the refugees started pouring into Romania, the first responders were not the government. The first responders to receive these refugees, to bless them, take care of their medical needs, feed them, get them on buses, this was all taken care of by the church. In fact, in fact, the Romanian government felt um, embarrassed by the relief effort of the church. No joke, you guys. They started going to Christian refugee centers and making people leave the Christian refugee centers just to take them to these crummy government centers only to have these people call the Christian refugee centers and say, come back and pick us up. We are not staying in the government centers. <laughs> in fact, one of the centers that we were at, the drug, the, the drug uh, ref, re, the center that changed into refugee center, they had taken care of 40,000 people within the first four weeks. Yep. Yeah. So on the second day, we were going to go into Ukraine. We were told that only Charlie and I should go. And, we were gonna, and I was like, yes, Charlie and I and the photographer. <laughs> and so anyways, so you got the three of us. And then the, uh, the night before, I really felt like, no, no, no. The women that we, that we got with us, the, the, they, are, the, they were born for this. So I said, our whole team's going. And we took our whole team. And it was Sunday. And on Sunday, we were going to go into Ukraine, our very first time going into Ukraine. And we were going to go to a church and worship with the people there. So it was, it was kind of interesting. You know, we're driving into Ukraine. You know, now listen, there's a fast way into Ukraine and there's a slow way into Ukraine. The fast way into Ukraine is you give them candy out the back of your vehicle. And they stuff their pockets full of candy. Then they let you, little tip. All right. So we got into Ukraine. We went to church there. And we were with just the people that had stayed. A large amount of the people of the church had actually already left uh, the country. So that Sunday morning, we worshiped Jesus with about 20 Ukrainians. And it was so cool. That was like, it was such a highlight. It was so interesting, you know, being in this environment where, you know, these are the people that were contending for the restoration of their country that said, we're not, we're not going to leave. We're going we're gonna to stay. It was also interesting. I told you guys this story last week about the connection with my dad and I. So my dad passed away in Ukraine. 
And um, uh, he, had, he had property there, a house there. He actually married a gal uh, there in Ukraine. And uh, so that was really interesting. My dad also did ministry with the soldiers in Ukraine back in 2014. So you'll remember on that one Sunday, I got out the Ukrainian flag and it was signed by the soldiers, right? So there's this really weird connection. So the day before I flew out to Ukraine, I got a call from my dad's pastor. And I thought that he had heard that I was going. I thought that he had heard. And he said, hey, it's so cool that you're, you know. He had no idea that I was going. The reason why he was calling was because they had found my dad's Bible. And now, this is a Bible that was given to my dad back in the 60s by his parents. And so it says to Daryl from your mom and dad. And it's all like, under, you guys, they've had this Bible for over six years. And they call me the day before I'm leaving. And he says, hey, so what are you up to? I said, I'm leaving for Ukraine tomorrow. He goes, that's crazy. I said, I know. Anyways, we're at this church, and I'm going to get up and, and just share a word. And the pastor introduces me by my dad's name. The, pa- the pastor says, Pastor Daryl, would you get up and greet the people? Anyways, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. Even in Portland, I called this guy out to give him a word. He comes up, he goes, I knew your dad. I was like, of course you did. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't even shocking. Anyways, when I got up that Sunday, I didn't get up to teach them. I didn't get up to preach to them. I, get, I got up to prophesy to them. And I said, we have come here from America not to teach you anything and not to preach at you. We've come here to prophesy that this is the greatest moment for your country. And I read Isaiah 60 about darkness, gross darkness covering the earth, but that the glory of God is about to arise and shine in the church in this hour. Yep, and then Charlie got up, and Charlie thought we were in a revival meeting. Charlie gets up and goes, put your hand on the person next to you. You know, and he starts calling people out, giving them words of knowledge. He goes, is somebody here got a right deaf ear? And they, they didn't respond. And finally they responded. And it was, the, it was the worship pastor got up with a deaf right ear. And maybe that's why he didn't respond. because he couldn't hear him, right? But anyways, he called them out. And he started pre- anyways, so, so when the service was over, they said, would you be willing to go to one of the pastor's homes because he had converted his home into a refugee place. He had like six bedrooms. And each of the bedrooms, he had moved a family into one of the bedrooms. Then he had a big loft, and he filled the loft with beds. So we drive to this house, this beautiful house out in the farmland. And we go in, and we walked into the first bedroom. There's a, there's a whole family crammed into this room, adult children. And we just go in, and we just start praying and prophesying. You, you don't even have to... You, you just welcome Holy Spirit, and people just start breaking down, weeping, shaking. Uh, the man, one man, the, 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 the uncle in that first room said, what have you experienced? He was just shaking. What did you experience? And he goes, I don't want to talk about it. Um, then we ministered to him, and Charlie gave him such a beautiful word. And then he said, okay, so I was in a building, and uh, they started bombing our area. It blew out all the windows out of my unit. Uh, I was freezing, and I would try to cover the windows back up, but they kept bombing. And so my, my unit just kept falling apart, and I couldn't stay warm in my, in, in my, in my flat uh, until finally the building collapsed on me. And I had to listen as my neighbor screamed for help for five hours until my neighbor finally died. Because no one came. It was stories like that. And it was one of those things where Holy Spirit would show up and then people would begin to open up. And what was incredible is um, uh, there, there were not a whole lot of refugees, okay, which was actually good. Because when we were there only 10 days later from, from the moment that we were following the headlines, um, that when we were there, things had really kind of calmed down quite a bit, which was, which was really, really good. But the refugees that were there that we were meeting with were the refugees that had fled from the east to the west and were staying put so that they could get back to their homes as quickly as possible, right? So some refugees, they are getting out of Ukraine for good, right? Without any, without any intent to return. And others are, are kind of staying put and, and ready to get back as quickly as possible. Upstairs, we met a, a, the, a family up in the loft, and they began showing us pictures of their home that had been bombed. They began to tell us how they would take care of Ukrainian soldiers, let them use their showers, and how they would feed them. It was, it was something else. On day three, we went to refugee centers where we interviewed um, refugees. That was kind of, it was one of those things where uh, it wasn't really set up for us to just to go in and minister. 
So it's one of those things where I had to kind of create ministry opportunities. How many of you know that in ministry, you got to be creative? Because very seldom will anything ever be handed to you. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, it wasn't set up, like I talked to one minister that he was from America. He'd been there for 10 days and hadn't had the opportunity of praying for anyone the entire time that he was there. And so there's a lot of opportunity for practical stuff, but it's a very kind of private culture, a very reserved kind of culture. So I said a thing. We were working with a reporter from USA Today, and this was my excuse. We're doing interviews with refugees. And they would set those up for us. So we'd set up these interviews We'd interview them, they'd tell us their story, and then I'd, then I'd say, ministry team, go. And they would go in, and Jesus would show up. People would just start weeping, and, and it, was, it was just really, really beautiful. On the last day, we went back into Ukraine. Um, we did a big, crazy shopping trip, big grocery shopping thing at Romania Costco. I forget the name of it. Romanco. And so anyways, they... Um, did this big shopping trip. We loaded up a whole bunch of vehicles with food and all this stuff. And we went in and we um, uh, 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 got to go and we got to minister to these children and they sang for us and it was, it was really incredible. Let me just say this, that we were expecting a war zone and what we experienced was a real peace. And when we, whenever we get the opportunity to bless people, of course, Holy Spirit would show up. But it really felt like there had been a shift. It really felt like this thing was coming to an end. And so that's how we would declare. Why? Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Right? So as believers, the only time we wage war is to bring peace. Our intent is always for peace. Hey, say amen. amen. Yeah. So we were over, and I'll tell you what was interesting. I'd have conversations with, with various people in various organizations, and I would say, it feels like something has shifted here. It feels like, it feels like the peace of God is, is, is being released on this country. And they'd say, oh, no, 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 no. And one of the things that I realized is that there are people, not, not, not everyone, but there are people that actually don't want this thing to end. And let me just say, there are people in the media that don't want this thing to end. And there are people in government that don't want this thing to end. And there are people, even in religious organizations, that don't want this thing to end. And so they will perpetuate stuff in order to keep a narrative. Now, I only see in part, why? Because I was just, I was only in a small little region. That country's been devastated, you guys, and people's lives have been devastated. But let me just tell you this. I don't think there's anyone here in this room that really knows what is going on, but our God knows exactly what is going on. And let me tell you something. This thing reeks of corruption on every level. So this is what we have to do. We have to pray. And we have to pray for the legitimate peace of God in Ukraine, which I believe is already there. And we got to pray that all counterfeit chaos would be exposed. I don't like, can I tell you something? I don't like counterfeit chaos. Why? You can't create with it. I say, I don't like counterfeit chaos because you can't create with it. It's not a legitimate substance. So we need to pray. We need to really pray. We need to pray for exposure on every level. And we need to pray that God would cut the strings of the puppet masters. Because... Because they don't care about innocent lives. And those clowns are in the U.S. government and the Ukrainian government and Russian government. Wherever there's power, you will find those demonic clowns. I, yeah. I don't like it. I don't like this thing. And so we need to pray. And I know we are praying. And you SRC intercessors are amazing. Guys, thank you so much for giving into this trip. We were able to give so much there to those people. Uh, med like medical supply, ton like I I'm sure you've seen the pictures. We've been putting them out. We were able to give, and that's because of you. So thank you so, so, so much. SRC, you are the most ridiculous, generous, faith-filled people. You are my people. I, I'm so stinking proud of you guys. And this is another thing I feel like the Lord highlighted to me, that when this stuff it hits the fan, because let me just tell you something. My mom and the Bible said there'd be days like this. 
The Bible says, don't be surprised when these things happen. So we need to be ready, yeah? And, and, and what I, one of the things I feel like that we're going to start doing is uh, I feel like we're going to start going and, um, and we will send scouts, vision teams in, spies to spy out the land. And then send our own teams. I'm really feeling like the future of Seattle Revival Center missions looks like us doing more than writing checks. Because I don't think we can really call ourselves an apostolic house if it's not a regular part of our culture to see the people of God going and actually doing this stuff for themselves. And that was one of the things, man, when I was there, I felt, I felt so convicted. I, I felt so, I felt a lot of things. And it took me a, a little while to process through. I'm still processing through it. But I know that we are in an Isaiah 60 time. I, this is not just a word for um, Ukraine or for Russia. Uh, gross darkness is covering the earth. And it is time for the church, the people of God, to arise and shine. That the glory of God would begin to come up and out. Yeah? Good. Well, God's doing some things. He's raising up a company of people who know who they are, who know their God, and who won't take no for an answer. The Lord is raising up a company of priests and kings. You see, part of the problem is that there are these beautiful metaphors that Jesus, Jesus was the king of metaphor and story and parable. Jesus would tell parables. But sometimes, sometimes we take Jesus literal when he wasn't actually being literal. How many know that Jesus said that, you know, if your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. He wasn't being literal. If he was, the majority of the church would only have one arm. And the majority of dudes would have no eyes. Anyways, so... When Jesus said that he is a shepherd and we are the sheep, right? When Jesus saw that the harvest was plentiful and they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said like sheep. The harvests are not literal sheep. How about this one? Follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. That's a metaphor. People that aren't Christians are not literal fish. Otherwise we could catch them and put them in a bowl. The point is this, that at a certain point, once you are saved, you are no longer a lost lamb. And you are no longer a fish. You now have revelation, and revelation's dangerous. And the reason why revelation's dangerous is because revelation makes you accountable. Once the Lord reveals something to you, I, I had a conversation with a lady this last week, and she used the word, she's not part of SRC. She's part of something quite interesting. <laughs> and she said, my husband and I have received revelation of what? Th that we need to get out of this thing that we're a part of. She now has revelation, and that means what? That she is now accountable. You see, sometimes good people take the word of God out of context in order to create cultures where people become dependent on their leadership. That kind of behavior is not tolerated biblically. Why? Because in the New Testament, the believers were not dependent on Peter, Paul, and Mary for their Christianity. In fact, horrible persecution came to the church, and that wasn't from the devil. Persecution came to the church, and it was from 
the Lord to do what? To grow the church. You see, they were like helpless sheep before they were saved. But when they stepped into a revelation of Christ, they recognized their sonship and their legitimacy. And the apostles never positioned themselves as a practical shepherd where they would be contingent on a codependent relationship with Apostle Peter and Paul in order to have that relationship sustained. If a human removed from your life would cost you your relationship with Christ, that human is an idol, it is a counterfeit Christ, and as pastors and leaders, we are never allowed to position ourselves in the life of others where we are your gateway to God, where we are your mediator to the Father. There's only one mediator, only one true shepherd, and that is Jesus the Christ. Don't worship me, worship Jesus. Don't allow me to be your vine. I don't want to be your vine. You need a word, a word from the Lord, come to my conference. No, you need a word from the Lord, shut off your YouTube and pray. In fact, this is what I know. Biblically, whenever things get really tense, whenever things get really hard, whenever things get really difficult, that's usually not the devil. In my own life, whenever things have gotten difficult, whenever I've found myself angry, it's usually not been the devil. It's usually the Lord saying, it's time for you to go deeper. It's time for you to go higher. And I will not allow 2021, Darren, to come into 2022. I am doing a new thing. Now listen now. 2021 Seattle Revival Center will not work in 2022. Why? God is doing a new thing. And that means as a company of priests and kings, you need to be on your face before God, on behalf of your family, on behalf of your business, on behalf of your church, on behalf of your nation. You are a middleman. You are an intercessor. Please. If you've been saved for longer than 90 days, it is no longer my responsibility to feed you. You've got a Bible, you've got YouTube. What else do you need? Maybe Holy Spirit, maybe that would be good. I need more equipping. You've been equipped. To the only reason why people say I need more equipping is because equipping justifies our disobedience when we believe that we cannot do the things that God commanded us to do because of a lack of knowledge when Jesus said the teacher is coming to you, teacher being the Holy Spirit. That means that Holy Ghost University, that means the seminary of heaven is inside of me and I've got a, I've got a, a, a a whole library of Holy Ghost resources in me. Whenever you don't know how to do what God has called you to do, rejoice. That's probably an indicator that it is He who has called you to it. God has called you to do something that you are not qualified for. God hates repeating history. History repeats itself when there's a generation that will not hear from heaven. Whenever a generation hears from heaven, history does not repeat itself. Why? Because the God who is above all time and space inserts himself into that generation. And there's a pattern interrupt that takes place through the obedience of God's people. If history is repeating itself, that means that yesterday looks like today, today looks like tomorrow. Maybe you are happy with that, but you are running in a hamster wheel of American religion where everything has become predictable, and that's why you do not see the evidence of the power of God within your life, and you don't. If your life is predictable, if you know exactly what next year is going to look like, if you know exactly what next week is going to look like, I can assure you of this. You are not seeing the power of God within your life. 
to the degree that you are seeing the power of God within your life, there is an unpredictability within your life. And there is this thing where you know that you have no idea where you could end up next year. Why? Because you are not the captain of your ship. Jesus is. That your sails are up. His wind is blowing. And you have truly surrendered your life to Christ. Which makes you come to this point where Paul was at. Where he's like, Paul, what's going on? I don't know. What, what are you doing? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. What's the plan? I don't know. And you're okay with that? Yeah. What do you know? I only know this. Christ Jesus and him crucified. I only know this. Christ Jesus and him crucified. I don't know about you, but God never gives me the details. He'll say, I want you to go and do this. I'll say, and then what? If I were to wait for the details, I would never obey Jesus. He never gives you the next step. You have to be obedient. Why, 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 why does he do that? Because he's really big on relationship. <laughs> he's really big on trust. He's like, I'm calling you to do this. Ah. Ah. Why? Because we're going to get to know each other really well. That if we're going to see people awaken to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ, I can tell you this. The latest program is not going to do it. The latest fad is not going to do it. The latest e-course is not going to do it. The latest Darren Stott idea. But I'm telling a, a, a company of people, a generation that is fully submitted to the Lord and that is quick to obey the Lord, such a generation will see signs, wonders, miracles. The goodness of the Lord will bring people to repentance. They will come to the end of themselves. What we need are not more church meetings, more church services. What we need are, are not more, you know, more opportunities for, for this, that, that. What we need is a people that fully believes that they are called of God, anointed by God, that by golly, they were actually created by God for such a time as this, that no other time in human history would have worked for you. It is God that created you. It is God that has chosen you. It is God that has anointed you. It is God. It is God. It is God. You're here because of God. You're here because of God. You're here because of Jesus. Jesus has called you. He has ordained you. He has filled you up with fire and glory from, from on high. Believe, believe, believe. If we will believe, we will receive. We will walk in these realities. Yeah. Yeah, but it sucks. Yeah, I know. But it's hard. Yeah, I know. But it's uncomfortable. Yeah, I know. I'm getting squeezed. Yeah, I know. What am I supposed to do, Pastor Darren? I don't know. This isn't an opportunity for you and I to get to love each other more. This is an opportunity for you and Jesus to get to know each other real well. Tonight we're going to, um, we're back in our Interrupters series and we're going to be looking at the Emperor Constantine. We're calling it the origin of Christianity. Like, where did, when did the cross become the symbol for Christianity? When did, when did church choirs become a thing? When did a, when did a pulpit become a thing? When, 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 did, when did the word Christian become a thing? Like, we're going to be looking at this uh, uh, tonight. We're, we're, we're diving to this. The, our series is about to get real wild. It's been crazy. But it's about to get, it's, in fact, if you're a mother, bring another mother on Mother's Day night because I'm going to show you two of the most Holy Ghost-filled mothers in church history that were filled with the fire of God. Oh, my gosh. It's like, it's just, so, like, it's awesome. These fiery, I mean, oh, my goodness. I was, like, in tears just telling our staff about it. I was like, ah. not really. I don't cry. Anyways, um, <laughs> these stories inspire us, yes, these stories are also preparing us. Why? Because the greatest things that human history has ever seen will pale in comparison to what God is about to do. There needs to be a last day's urgency within the church where we stop saying, we're getting everything ready for the next generation. We're getting everything ready for the next generation. We're getting everything... Why? So you can watch TV all day? My ceiling will be your floor. No, nah, come on. Stop it. Is your heart still beating? We're getting out. No, 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 no. 
The eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro, and he's not looking for, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a marketing department to say, Look, how can we find the most influential community of influencers? We want to find influencers who are leading. Where can we find some, some people with at least, you know, 20,000 followers on Instagram? Some really cool people. We're going we're gonna to use, no, no, no. The eyes of the Lord are scanning the earth, looking for people that just say, I don't know if I have anything to give, but I'm available. I am available, and God, you can, make, you can make me out to be like a fool. I, I, I pretend to know nothing but this, Christ Jesus and him crucified, and I will lay down my life to see people come to know him, to see people get wrecked with the good news of the gospel. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. The great Welsh revivalist Evan Roberts in two years, they saw over 100,000 people give their lives to Christ. In two years. They actually say that when you go into Ireland, you could feel the electricity. Ireland, into Wales. The Lord's calling us to Ireland, babe. All right, when, when you go into, that's where Tom Cornell is. I was supposed to be there. I disobeyed and the Lord sent him. Anyways, um, I'm just kidding. Um, when you go into Wales, they say that you could feel the electricity of heaven in the ground, when you'd go across the boundary line, you could feel heaven like radiating, like buzzing out of the soil because the country had been so impacted by the glory of God, by the, by the, by the presence of the Lord. And that whole thing, it happened because of intercession. It happened because people are crying out to the Lord because people are waiting on God. But it also happened because a young man said, God, squeeze me like a tube of toothpaste. What he actually said, in his own words, is God, bend me. He cried out, God, bend me. For the sake of whales, bend me. And you know what God did? He honored his request. And he showed up, and he showed off in such an unprecedented way there in that country. That story doesn't exist to tease us about how good things used to be. That story exists, like the book of Acts, to invite us. It's a portal. It's an opening. We talk about these stories. We, we engage with our remembrance. We talk about what God is doing. We talk about uh, not breaking in and of ourselves, but we talk about God. We talk about the angelic realm. We talk about heaven and what happens. The atmosphere begins to change. All of a sudden, we begin to believe. All, all of a sudden, Jesus begins to show up. All of a sudden, gold starts to come on your hands. All of a sudden, oil starts to cover your forehead. All, all of a sudden, Jesus begins to show up. All of a sudden, your, your bad dreams start turning into good dreams. All, all of a sudden, you don't know if you're in your body or out of your body, but you're engaging places within the Spirit. All of a sudden, things begin to change. All of a sudden, you're like, like I am living a life that I've read about in the Word of God. All of a sudden, you're like, whoa, I'm changing. Wow, wow, other people's lives are changing. This is the gospel of the good news. This is Jesus. This is the kingdom. This is exciting. This is awesome. The devil has nothing on this. And this is a reality that the Lord is inviting us into. He has anointed you. He has called you. He has chosen you. All we say is, yes, God. All we say is, yes, God. Squeeze me, bend me, mold me. This is uncomfortable. Why? Because the Lord loves me too much to remain the same and to stay in the same place. Just say the persecution is good. Listen, the chaos is good as long as it's real chaos. Counterfeit chaos, that's just created by men to get their agendas. They create chaos in order to insert their agendas. You can't do nothing with that. But true chaos is an incubator for creation. Well, Kelsey, you better come up here. I just put out your hands. Father, I thank you for a fresh anointing for Kelsey. Your eyes are on her. You love her. You have called her. You have chosen her. I see swirling all about you. I see a tornado of creativity above you. 
and I see the Lord coming and he's untethering you from all fear, from all limits. I see him setting you free to soar. I see the toolbox of heaven opening up. I see the toolbox of heaven inside your spirit. I see tools and resources, tools and resources, tools and resources. And the Lord says that the wind of my spirit is going to stir you. In this time, there is a stirring. There is a holy discontentment. And it is the Lord and the Father says, a fresh anointing, my daughter. A fresh anointing is coming upon you. A fresh anointing of joy, a joyful courage, yet that you will not bow your knee to any idol. You will not bow your knee to no man, but you will use who you are. You will use your mind, your body, and spirit to bring reconciliation and healing, to bring understanding. And the Lord says he is about to give to you a fresh gift of understanding. Even the spirit of understanding is going to come upon you in this time. The understanding of mysteries. Father, I thank you, Lord that Kelsey has the mind of Christ and I call you blessed and I release you in Jesus name from a spirit of religion yep 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 that would like to define the boundaries the Lord says all your fountains are in him hallelujah 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 the Shabbadaba Shikadabamba yeah 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 I like, can I pray for these two guys sitting by you, Dave, this husband and wife? Can I pray for you guys? Do you, you want to come on up? We, ha we, have to, we have to demonstrate. We can't just talk about a fresh anointing. We have to demonstrate. We have to, we have to take anointing oil and anoint people. And Paul would say, don't, don't neglect the stirring up of the gifts with the laying on of hands. And so when we lay hands in, on people, there's a stirring up of the gifts. There's something that happens in the natural, but then there's something that happens in the spirit as well. You say, well, Darren, what are you going to do now? I already told you I don't have a clue. I, 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 I don't have a clue why, because God never gives me step two. Guys, go ahead and just lift up your hands. I know we've talked before, but we don't really know each other, right? Father, I just thank you, Lord, for a fresh anointing right now in Jesus' name. A fresh anointing. A fresh anointing. Lord, your anointing breaks every heavy yoke. Your Wow, anointing breaks every heavy, weighty thing. And I just see the Lord lifting you up. I just see him lifting you up on eagle's wings. I just see that place where you will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. It's not just for you. It's for your family. The Lord says that he's lifting off any heavy, weighty, even religious thing off of family. And the Lord is lifting your family up on the wings of eagles. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, for wisdom and understanding. I see the Lord coming even with a candle and he's, and he's lighting a candle and I just see that a room is filling up with light and the Lord says that he's going to show you things that have been in the dark it's not a scary thing, it's a wonderful thing it, because the Lord's going to light up the room to show you the treasures even generational inheritance that you didn't even know about, the Lord says I'm about to illuminate the treasury room in your, in your family line and the Lord says that there's still time to honor what is in your family line so it can come into complete fullness into complete manifestation father I thank you Lord that you're that you that you are the way the truth and the light Jesus you are coming into you're coming into Lord their family Lord you're gonna illuminate Lord what's been hidden hallelujah God you're gonna lift them up they're coming into a, a season of effortless union <laughs> uh, effortless union yeah 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 and so much fun I see I see like uh, as, like like you are like a like a, you like to stir things up you know, and um, and I just see like I just see like in the spirit things are things are getting stirred up and it's really good and you're like but I don't know if it's good this seems kind of crazy a lot of stuff is super crazy right now and the Lord says no things are getting stirred up but it's good and the Lord says the Lord says that He is in the whirlwind that He's using the whirlwinds in this time and they're stirring things up and the Lord says don't be afraid when everything's getting stirred up and things are getting blown here there and and and, and, and elsewhere the Lord says I'm in the whirlwind.
whirlwind and I am blowing. And the Lord says, but I will not blow you away. I, I, I see you standing. I see you standing firm. That you are standing firm. And the Lord says that you are going to partner with the winds of change. And I just speak redemptive, restorative change. The Lord says, I am not coming to destroy. I'm, calling, I'm coming to rebuild. So Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your winds of change. And Lord, I thank you. Everything's getting blown blown here and there and elsewhere. Yep, 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 yep. There's a stirring up, and yet it is good, Lord. You're not coming to destroy. You're coming to rebuild. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah? Cool, 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 cool. Well, let's, let's stand to our feet. I, I don't know if this is for someone. I hear bones. Would you just lift up your hands to heaven? Just go ahead and just close your eyes. Tell your mind to shut up. Would you just repeat after me and say, Speak to me, Lord. Your child is here. Listening. And whatever you say to me, Lord, my answer is yes. Because I trust you. Speak to me, Lord. Your child is here. Here he comes. Here he comes. More oil, Lord. More wine. More oil right now. More wine right now. How many of you, you're hearing from the Lord and you know you're going to need more oil. You're going to need more wine. So just receive it by faith right now. Some of you, you're not even going to be able to say yes to him unless you have more oil. More wine. If you're watching online, I just declare more oil. More wine. If you're watching online, what's your answer? Will you say yes? Will you go? Will you allow him to arise and shine within you? Will you allow for his wind of the Spirit to blow in your sails? Here at Seattle Revival Center, will you allow him to arise and shine in you in a new way? Will you allow him to speak to you, to do something that you are not qualified for? Will you allow him to call you to do something that you've never done before? Will you say yes to a giant that you have not slayed before? Will you be willing to surrender everything? The good, yes. The bad, yes. Would you be willing to give him everything that you are for his purposes and for his glory? If your answer is yes this morning, let's say it together. One, two, three. Yes. Would you do me a big favor? Would you share what the Lord has spoken to you with somebody that you love and trust, somebody that you're close with? Would you, would you let him know, hey, listen, I need to tell somebody. I need to tell you, because you're my friend, and I love you, and I trust you. The Lord has spoken to me. Some things are going to be changing in my life. I need to tell you so that when you see the change, you understand why. Will you do that, SRC? I can't hear you. Will you do that, SRC? Awesome. That's all I got for you.